Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. You can also donate to the podcast by clicking donate at CanadaEHX.com. Today on the podcast, I have probably one of the most famous Canadians out there. Someone who has literally left the Earth, gone into space. I'm talking about Canada's first female astronaut, Dr. Roberta Bondar. Today we're going to talk about her foundation, the things we can do to help the Earth, and how going into space can change your perspective about our role on this planet. So let's get right to it question is how was the Roberta Bondar Foundation formed? Well it's it's a it, that's a very interesting question. Uh, a number of years ago I was chancellor at a university at Trent University in Ontario and at the time I was presenting uh, as chancellor I at the end of every year I tried to present a piece of my art to the to the university and it was always on days when uh, we could get a lot of people in because people wanted to see not only see the photography but hear about it and so i was finding that i was talking about art and science and did more and more people would come to these things and finally at the end of it all when i was uh, my term my second term as chancellor was over the president who has also uh, finished her terms said to me how about thinking about, um, you know, how can you do this to a wider audience? How can you bring these kinds of messages about the environment to a wider audience? So we sort of talked about creating a foundation. That's, that's really, it, it started because my, the value that I have was, uh, and still have to this day, was trying to connect people to the, the wonders and creativity that we have in the natural world, because the natural world provides such a such a, a, a basis for looking at new things and trying to design new pieces of technology and also to make us more familiar with what habitat changes are and what changes are to the environment around us. So that's basically uh, where it came from. I, I often saw, saw young people as being uh, these days in some cities uh, being very confined to more of a human environment, human-made uh, environment. And I thought that seeing things in the natural world might provide them with a, with a different type of life experience. That's, that's, that's one of the other things I, w- I was thinking about. So I guess those are the three things to connect people to the natural world through photography and trying to get uh, young people out of doors and, and trying to look at things in the natural environment that could stimulate uh, our creativity. And uh, so uh, obviously you've, you've been into space and uh, you've seen kind of the, the blue marble from a, a perspective that most of us don't get to see except from video and pictures. So do you feel like that kind of gave you a special perspective on just how fragile life on earth uh, actually is? Certainly we're not able to see it as a blue marble. Uh, and I think that kind of view that they had on the lunar expeditions in the 1970s would be quite remarkable. And we'll have it shortly, I think, with the next few years of people returning to the moon. But you raise a good point. Seeing the Earth as the planet that it is, is quite remarkable. We see about 1,200 kilometers out the window, whether it's the International Space Station or the shuttle program. It's an opportunity to see the edge of the planet. It's also an opportunity to look away from the planet and see stars that don't twinkle and come back and look at this beautiful turquoise blue reflecting off the planet. I mean, it's back to our eyes. It's, it really can be quite moving. And, and I think that's the, kind of, that's the kind of experience that I had and somehow I wanted to be able to translate that for other people. And uh, in regards to the foundation, uh, what, what kind of things does it do to kind of help and, and spread awareness? And you kind of did touch on that on the first question. We are trying to approach things in a cross-generational manner, for sure. We've had four, what we call the pillar foundation, um, well, the foundation pillars, uh, the four of them uh, since the inception and back in 2009, uh, one of them was the traveling or is the traveling exhibition and learning experience or the tally. And that's kind of we're looking at more online things right now for it, but it will come back out into exhibitions in the future. We have uh, research and seminars, which we could get into in a little bit. 
uh, we had programs, we had programs that deal with uh, things like workshops that, that we've had before that have been quite successful. Uh, we're trying to move things online at the moment because there is such a need for it. And that brings us to one of the other pillars, which is called the Bonder Challenge. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a program that has been quite successful in schools, wilderness settings, uh, in parks, uh, in, even internationally and at summer camp. So it's been, it, it's really been one that's engaged uh, young people to become I think become more involved in the environment. All right. Uh, you actually answered my next three questions with that. <laughs> so. Oh dear. Oh dear. We can't do that. <laughs> Very efficient. Uh, so I guess the next question, what role do you feel photography plays in spreading the message about our need to care for the environment? For sure, a lot of people have cameras. I think most people find photography very accessible, whether it's doing selfies or taking pictures of whatever they do. <laughs> it's something that is not, people don't have any fear of, not like in the old days, people had a lot of trepidation about cameras because people didn't have money to buy the cameras. And even today, some of these instruments uh, that have cameras in them are, are fairly high end. But nonetheless, a lot of people have access to, to iPhones or smartphones or some type of tablet. So the, the technology of photography is much more widespread than it used to be. Photography provides a person an opportunity to be engaged in something when they look at it through the lens that they spend enough time. So either through the viewfinder or through the lens, one can actually start looking around at things and then look at the artistic ways that one can photograph to make things a bit more appealing to the human visual system or by expressing someone's feelings that they have at that time. Uh, so we, we try to teach a, teach a range of programs in the foundation to try to accommodate different needs, but using, using the lens as a, it's almost like a metaphor of reaching, reaching through the way I did, reaching through the window with my eyes or with the lens of the camera to see the planet in a different way, to become engaged in it uh, in, a, in a different, from a different perspective. And that's the kind of thing that photography allows us to do. What got you interested in photography? My interest in photography stemmed back from when I was a child. And I mean, I can't, well, actually I can't remember <laughs> ever not seeing a camera in my dad's hand, my uncle, was a pharmacist and he loved photography as my did my dad but my dad couldn't afford these things and <laughs> so my uncle would loan him these cameras and sometimes they were sort of lifelong loners <laughs> i mean i thought <laughs> he i thought used to be able to buy leicas and nikons uh in the in every drugstore because of course he was a pharmacist and had a drugstore mm -hmm. and sold these things <laughs> but i i have pictures of and actually there's about 40 hours of movies of the old eight millimeter movies of me growing up from the time i was a little girl riding a tricycle <laughs> there are pictures of me as a little baby i mean that that's quite unusual back in the 1940s and in the early 50s so all through mm -hmm. my life cameras have have formed a huge part of it and it's a part of the the biography of a person's life it's also been for me a scientific journey as well, because of course in my PhD and master's work, I used cameras and photography heavily uh, for the microscope work that I was doing. And then of course uh, in medicine, we used it to, in pathology to journalize things. Uh, so it's, it's, it's been omnipresent in my life. And certainly in the space program, I wanted to do as much as I could with earth observation and the various camera types we had. I think something like 13 different camera types on my particular mission. It was right at the beginnings of electronic cameras now called digital cameras. <laughs> uh, so it was, and we had the IMAX camera on, so I learned how to use that. And there's a, a, a film called Destiny in Space, which has some of the IMAX footage from uh, my particular flight. And after that, I thought, I wanted to go and photograph all of Canada's national parks before the end of the millennium. So I went to uh, an institute in the United States, a professional photography institute and studied professional landscape and nature photography to make sure I had the skills to use these large format cameras, to use panoramic cameras, to, to take things from different points of view, to be really creative uh, through the lens with these different cameras. Uh, and, and so it's, it's enriched not just my experience, but I think it helps people to know that I'm not just telling people what to do, that I continue to work with cameras. And so cameras have been part of my creativity, part of my connection to technology ongoing. 
And there's a lot about science that's that's not just in the technology of uh, photography, but but the things that I see through the lens, and that's what we try to capture for the people doing these Bonder challenges. Uh, in regards to the Bonder Foundation, what are the core principles you would say uh, of the foundation? Well, we're trying to provide uh, a more of a universal experience for for people to be able to connect them in a way that's that's important to them, to be able to to help them facilitate uh, an environment experience. So we just feel that the kind of mission and value statements that we have online are ones that that we feel are are, are not time sensitive. They're ones that will be there for all time. Uh, they don't have a, a best before date. Um, so they're, they have, they're various things that, that we try to do in the foundation in terms of cross-generational uh, education. Um, I think embracing the environment as part of a personal, uh, part of a person's heritage is important to be able to connect and try to protect the environment. We always believe um, that infusing art and science together will give people an opportunity to not fear science or to not denigrate art, but to understand that they, they're very powerful uh, combined together, uh, that they can allow us then to, to move beyond something that's just a, a simple thing to something that's, that's so much a part of us uh, that we fall in love with something in the environment and I've always felt that if you love something, you'll want to protect it. And that's what we try to do in the foundation is to try to help facilitate that engagement across all generations. Um, so for about 60 years now, humans have been going into space. Uh, and in the next 10 years, we might see more and more humans going into space as it becomes more commercialized and companies get involved. As people go into space, do you feel like collectively our view of our role on earth will change? Uh, more than it has now? I think it's inevitable. I, I, I have to, I think, color that with a, with a bit of a, a, a tint, though. We've seen how COVID has affected the way we view things and the way we view people and human behavior. We understand that things can be politicized. So we're not quite sure where that's going to end because human behavior is a is very finicky and it's something that changes across landscapes. It changes across cultures. And it, it really depends on the kinds of earth issues that we have. But I think if I, if I can just move slightly past that and look at things with a glass half full, and that would be, there are things that we're developing from our trips into space, our sojourns, our our voyages, as short as they may be, that provide us better things for human life on Earth, better technologies, the drive to go into space, the big questions that, that are asked uh, give us big answers, things like developing different types of batteries, better solar power, the ability to have better telehealth, uh, all kinds of things in mining. There are many, many spinoffs from the space program that will enhance our life here on Earth, and who knows where that will take us. And uh, in regards to the foundation, uh, it's kind of hard to say because of COVID, uh, but what, uh, what is on tap for the uh, foundation going into 2021? Well, we've been, uh, we've been very excited by the kinds of things that we've been able to do. Uh, certainly COVID has pushed everybody to try to look at more online delivery, which what we have what we have done, we put a lot of tools online, and we'll continue to do that, because I think even after COVID's over, people see that there is a value for a hybrid model of education, uh, doing things more accessible online, and really trying to develop things that are that people can trust. That there's facts that that people can trust, and that we are a trusted website and a trusted source of of information. In the near future, and I'm talking in 2021, we're hoping to get back on track with some of the field work in the, the project that uh, we affectionately, well, I actually, it's my fault. It's, uh, we have an acronym. NASA has an acronym for everything. So the, the research project on migratory birds is known as Space for Birds, which is great. But I have the acronym AMAS, which stands for Aviation Migration Aerial Surface and Space. So the AMAS project requires a lot of field work 
it requires uh, our ongoing participation. And I'm a principal investigator for this research work on behalf of the foundation with NASA looking at some of the migratory pathways of birds uh, using International Space Station imagery, for example, or some a few from the uh, older space shuttle days, but ones that provide us with a better sweep and understanding of what types of corridors these migratory birds use. And then we develop story maps to look at the different types of habitat use over time. We talk about I talk about these birds as being very, very important to our lives here on Earth for many, many reasons. Uh, so the AMAS project is going to continue, and I do imagery on the ground on the surface and also from helicopters to put together the story of uh, this three-piece story or three-perspective story uh, about migratory birds and their habitat requirements. So in the near future, we'll see we'll see that again uh, and we'll have some more video and certainly as technology improves our videos will improve <laughs> and our way of delivering <laughs> and our way of delivering it so when we get back to the traveling exhibitions which we're hoping to mount uh, as well we'll have uh, much more in terms of well, I can't say b-roll but it's the idea of having some more interactive things to go along with a with an exhibition and looking at how we can make things more available to people online we really have uh, an interest in the international community because I think Canada has a lot of strengths and we are very credible here in, in, in our position in North America. So we would like to be able to uh, join the people uh, in the United Nations Environment Program, for example, who've helped us with some of our, our bird identification uh, spots. Uh, we are photographing the lesser flamingo, for example, in Africa and the black-tailed godwit and the curlew sandpiper offshore. So we can bring those kinds of things to Canada and in North America, we can talk to people in other countries about the whooping crane and about the, the wonderful things we've been able to do in the conservation program here in North America. And then we'll look at the piping um, plover and uh, the red knot, uh, are there birds in the Sprague's pipit? Those are ones that we're quite interested in. So I think trying to bring this to an international level, uh, mm -hmm. continue to continue our work is what we'll be doing right through 2021 for sure. And of course, the other bonder challenges uh, and mm -hmm. other parts of our programs. And then uh, just my last question is if people are interested in the Bondar Foundation, they want to get in touch with it, learn more about it, take part in the challenges and all of that, uh, what exactly do they need to do? We have a, a great website. I, I mean, I'm very proud of it. We have actually more than one website. We have one dedicated to Space for Birds. We have another one, the Roberta Bonder Foundation, and it has contact information on there. We have uh, obviously links to, uh, to our Twitter feed. We have links to our Facebook page. Uh, we have Instagram, LinkedIn that's uh, attached to the, the foundation as well. So we have a number of these various handles that uh, that people can access our programs, access the information, the content, and if there if there's interest on people for more than what's out there, then we're we're thrilled to be able to receive some notes and cards from people um, saying, hey, you know, what about X, Y, or Z? Our website is updated uh, continuously, and it kind of, most people understand that. As the time goes by, there are a lot of broken links on these websites. We spend a lot of time making sure that our blogs and our everything that we do are really current so that if there's something in a blog that people think, hey, that, that's interesting, I'd like to learn more, there's usually a link uh, to click on and it takes you to some some other place that, that, that we are fairly convinced will get you to that place. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that episode and my talk with Dr. Roberta Bondar. If you did, please leave a rating and review. You can reach me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And again, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Just like all of these wonderful people have. Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., Vic Hedges, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, Spencer M., and Iris Gray. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.